everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So this is uh, the start of part three for Eat Your Bible. Um, and what this is is basically a, a course about your Bible. Um, the, the resources that it provides, the tools, how to use it, all those things. Um, and so we've been talking a lot about um, how it was formed, the processes of translation, why we have the Bible and why it is what we have. And we're getting closer and closer to, to the moment where we start to kind of break in and say, okay, now, now we know all this stuff, how can we use it to develop our own personal Bible studies so that we can read it and study it to live and to grow from it. And so um, tonight is going to be a lot like what, I think it was Tom Landry, I think, who said he brought out the football to his team and he said, this is a football. And they, this is a professional, I think it was the Cowboys. And he was basically saying, we're going to go back to the basics. And so this is another... Uh, part of it. So a lot of this stuff you might already know. So here's what I'm hoping for those of you that know some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. That's going to encourage you. They're going to say, oh yeah, I knew that. And I can continue knowing that. Um, a lot of times when I am affirmed in the things that I know, it, it strengthens me. It says, okay, I'm not, wasn't off too, too far with this, this stuff here. So um, <clears throat> we're going to uh, dig right into the idea of what is inside our Bible? But first, guess what we're going to do? Our timeline. No, no. Our event line. And no, I didn't print it out. Because the idea is for you yes, to be able to... Yes, all day. We need to do something I today. did. But I want you guys to be able to write this out. And so um, the reason why we're doing this... Uh, I'm calling it the event line because we're not going to put any times on it because... Really, uh, honestly, for a lot of us, time, like time dates and all those things don't really matter so much as understanding where things happen. So we're going to call this the event line. And we're going to start off with what we've been talking about for the past two weeks, and it's these lines here. So can you guys tell me what is these four dashes? What are they? Creation. Fall. Blood. Tower of Babel. And so you got the hand right. So creation, fall, flood, Tower of Babel. So good. So let's go ahead and just maybe, maybe we should write these things on here so we can be confirmed, right? So uh, this was what? Creation, fall, flood, and Tower of Babel. All right. We put them there because why? We put them in those dashes because why? Yeah, there, there isn't a real strong understanding of, you know, an actual time and those things. Now, we can, there are, there are some who can put dates together and, and, and make a, a good guess of what those are, but honestly, there's no real time frame for those things are. So I call those prehistory, um, and that's just because it just happened before recorded history. We don't know when those actually happened. But now we have this continuing line, continuous line here, and that's when we can start putting dates down, even though we're not going to talk about dates. So um, the very first event that we have on this timeline is called the what? First time. Patriarchs. And we put a what? A letter what? P. A letter P. That's the patriarchs. Patriarchs are people like who? Isaac and Jacob. Yes, right. So, um, so the patriarchs here. Now uh, from the patriarchs, we move to another moment, another event in the timeline, which is what? Exodus. Exodus. Good. Look at that. Exodus, and then after the Exodus is the what? The wandering. So we spell out the word pew. However you want to think of that, pew or pew. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we have these, Exodus uh, and the wandering. And then after the wandering, what's the next thing on the list? The sea, the conquest. Right. Conquest. All right. You guys are doing amazing so far. Now, so far, um, the, the idea is for us to be able to mentally picture this in our minds so that when we're talking about Bible stories, we can go, okay, what happened in the Exodus? Well, there's some major events that happened in the Exodus. We can say, okay, that happened after the Tower of Babylon. Sometimes people get confused about that. And just being able to have that 
be able to kind of have it in your mind and, and on a even on a loose basis like this really helps us to have that confidence to, to, uh, to teach and to talk to other people about, about the Bible. So after conquest comes what? This is, now we just covered these last week and it was actually the week before, before the Seder. So um, uh, we may be kind of rusting this, but what comes after the conquest? Judges. Judges. Well, look at that. So put a J there. Okay. And the judges come this very, all the letters are crammed together. What are some of those letters there? S. S, yeah. D. Okay, S. 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 Oh, you're talking about the kings. No. Yes, those the here. Scene. We put these inside these parentheses just for clarity's sake. And what's the first S stand for? Saul. 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 No, not Saul. Samuel. Samuel. So Samuel, Samuel was the last of the judges. The first of the major big uh, prophets to come through, so he's kind of a dual role there. But he plays such a big a big role in this in this uh, storyline that we put him here. And then from Samuel comes his work with who? Saul. With Saul, right? So we have an S. So it's S S. And then after Saul came who? David. David. And then after King David came his son, son Solomon. All right, great job with all of that. So now let's talk about some, some of the newer stuff we put on this timeline. Um, let's see, let me test you guys. What were some things we had up on this on these two things here? What does this represent, first of all? So, yeah, the divided kingdom. So this here represents the united kingdom. This is when the kingdom of Israel was united. And then after... Solomon, uh, there was a revolt, and that revolt ended up with dividing uh, Israel and what was the other major nation? Yeah. Judah. Judah. Which one's on top? Which one's on top? Israel. Israel on top. Judah's on the bottom. So, and that's also geographically geographically correct. Israel is on top. <laughs> Judah's on the bottom. So I'll just put an I right here and a J right here, and that's just for our information here. Now, I mentioned that there was kings and kingdoms. We're not going to really dig into that because a lot of those people had Jehoiachin and Jehoiakim and, Je and Jehoshaphat and all of those things. And you're like, okay, so we're just going to go ahead and say, uh, what I like to do is just kind of categorize it together, is that the Judah had one dynasty, meaning there was one family that ruled throughout the entire reign, and that was the house of David. Israel, not so much. <laughs> they had 10 different dynasties. And those dynasties represented people that were kings that uh, kings and that were not even part of Israel at all. They just, they were servants of the king. They were captains of the army. And so this was a really disjointed system of government and leadership in Israel. And this was one united household. That doesn't mean that there wasn't anything that went wrong with this down with this it's one house kingdom here. Um, for the most part, it didn't always go this way, but it usually went uh, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. Sometimes it went good, bad, good, bad, 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 good, 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 bad, bad. Again, I don't really want to worry about that with this timeline here, but just know that this was a divided kingdom, not just divided in uh, two places, but divided up here, and then divided in your loyalty to God. So those are those things there. <clears throat> All right. You guys feel comfortable with that? You want to put some new information on it? Let's put some new information on it. <coughs> All right, so you got this right. Creation, fall, flood, tower, battle. You got this right. The patriarchs, Egypt, the Exodus, wilderness, conquest, judges, Samuel, David, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon. And then, let's put, ugh, there we go. All right. Here we have Judah on the bottom and Israel on the top. Here's what I want us to do. Let's add some things at this at the breaks between these two, okay? So at the top of your timeline, put A, exile. And at the bottom, you put B, exile. Now, the A and B signifies who took over who, right? So um, the A stands for Assyria. So the kingdom of Assyria is the one that... that uh, it took over Israel, 
put them into exile. But honestly speaking, after that, Israel was no more until 1946. So, um, <clears throat> so really, this is almost the destruction of Israel up here. The B stands for another nation. Anyone take a guess what the B stands Babylon. for? Babylon, right. <clears throat> so Babylon uh, is the second one. And I guess I got to put the, the red one. I'll wait. So A is what? Assyria. Assyria. B is what? Babylon. Babylon. And that's, that's, that's important in the way we are looking at this event line because um, especially when we look at the continuation of Judah as it comes back um, later on, um, Babylon is important to the story of Israel because we see a lot of things that God does through Babylon. What are some of the stories you can think of how God works through Babylon? Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel and the lion's den, right. So we got Daniel and the lion's den. That, was, that happened because of Babylon. <coughs> What's another event that was important because of Babylon? I'm gonna. Everyone needs another chance to talk, Rachel. <laughs> I know they're not. What are some of the other? What's another story that happens because of in Babylon and because of Babylon? Let's do a fire. Lots of it. The, the fiery furnace, right. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that happened in Babylon. So this is the, the Babylonian exile here. Um, some of the dreams that were happening, uh, Daniel's dreams were in Babylon. The big the tower, the big, what's that? The whole book of the Bible. <laughs> um, and so uh, we want to remember, I want you to remember that Babylon is important to the story of, of Israel and of Judah. So, you got that right? Got that all down? All right. So, next week we're going to be able to put these two on here in the breaks. Now let's continue on with something else. All right, here we go. Once the exile is um, over, for the most part, there were, there were three returning. So, the first return, so one R, and then two R. That means the first return, the second return. Now, those were not, what I mean by return, so Judah gets to go back to Jerusalem, gets to go back to the promised land, um, and they're able to survey the land, they're able to kind of revisit the land, some of them are re they get re-encouraged when they're in the land, but they don't get to stay there. So, the first return, they go there, they come back. Second return, they go there, and they come back. And then, so we got that, so one R just stands for first return. Second return. Then we have two more. The third return. And then after the third return, they get to go back again. And guess what happens when they go back again? They get to stay. And that's where they build the walls of Jerusalem again. Is that what? <coughs> What's that? Is that a JW? That's a JW, yes. <laughs> yes, that's a JW. J uh, Jerusalem Wall is what that means. Yeah, so Jerusalem Wall. I, I was thinking, is it WJ, Wall of Jerusalem? I didn't know what to put on there. W, no, because we got W. J, no, because we got J, so I just put JW. So it can be a lot of things. But here it's Jerusalem Wall. Any questions which is here? Because we're going to do some more things. I'm going to challenge you here for a second. Because now once we get this basic structure down, after this, the basic uh, idea of this event line is formed. From here, we'll be able to put a lot of things and hang a lot of things on this timeline right here. So you have uh, a good structure to talk about the stories of Scripture. So any questions? So what comes first on this one? This line, what comes first? First return. The Jerusalem Wall. And then how about these, uh, the exiles? Who exiled Israel? Syria. Syria. Who exiled uh, Judah? Babylon. Babylon. Good. All right. Next week we're going to be able to continue on. But let's look at the next one. This is a challenge. Let's see what happens. Now we can put some books of the Bible in here. So Genesis 1 through 11 covers these first prehistory things. So when you think about Genesis 1 through 11, when you think about when you think about the stories in, in the in, in the Bible, you think, okay, where where in 
Genesis is Noah. Well, it's somewhere in Genesis 1 through 11, right? So, yeah, so six, but at least you know that this, 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 you have some confidence that it's in the first 11 chapters. Some would even say, <coughs> excuse me, some would even say that if you don't understand the first 11 chapters of Genesis, the whole rest of Scripture is a little bit clouded for you. That's how important the first, uh, first 11 chapters of Genesis is. Then the rest of Genesis belongs to just the story of the patriarchs. So Genesis 12 through 50 is just the patriarchs. With that, you have some information to be able to say, okay, if I want to talk about uh, Abraham, I know, I know I'm going somewhere in Genesis 12 through 50, probably in the earlier parts, so maybe 12, 13, 14, and you'll look over there and find it there. When you're able to do that, you gain confidence. Okay, well, there it is. Now we can go through. You can do it faster. All right, so Genesis 1 through 11 is this prehistory. Genesis 12 through 50 is the patriarchs. Couple more. The uh, Exodus and the Wilderness covers four different books, and I have them here: Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. <laughs> so when when we um, talk about these first um, these first five books of the Bible, what are we talking about? What is that called? The first five books of the Bible. What is that called? The Pentateuch. The Pentateuch, otherwise known as the what? The Torah, otherwise known as the what? The law. Oh. Right? So the Pentateuch, the Torah, the law. Those are the first five books of the Bible. Now, I'm hoping that you look at that going, okay. Uh, it's a little bit daunting maybe right now, but at least I get some, I'm getting some clearer understanding of, what, of what's happening here. So from here to here is, in essence, for the Hebrews, one big long book. Called the Pentateuch. So we've divided up into five. All right. I just want to cover this, go a little bit further with you. Go that there. All right. The, the conquest is the book of Joshua. You want to talk about the conquest? You talk about the book of Joshua. What's in the conquest? What stories are in the book of Joshua? Jericho. Jericho. The, 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 the walls that fell in Jericho, right? So Jericho is in Joshua. The, uh, the spies are in Joshua. Gideon. What's that? Gideon. Gideon. Yeah. Uh, so Gideon over here, Judges and Ruth over here. So, um, so, and then so with Judges come Judges. And then um, I put in here Ruth just because. Um, but Ruth isn't really part of the Judges story. Uh, in essence, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating book and there's, there's a lot of things about it. And I will note also that later on when we start putting more books of the Bible in this timeline, the book of Job is considered a wisdom literature, a poetry, but it's not going to belong anywhere in here where we think it goes. We believe that Job actually fits somewhere somewhere in here, kind of in, almost in that prehistory area. Some of the stories are in Job. There's, there's, there's some... There's some Significant, significant moments in the story that say, I don't know if this is where this exactly belongs. So a lot of people believe that Job somewhere was right around here, even maybe in between Babylon and, or uh, Tower of Babel and the, the, the uh, uh, patriarchs. So, and I think that is all we're going to cover with that. Yep, that is it. All right, I'll let you write those things down if you want to, if you got them on your, your notes or you want to take a picture of it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Again, we have the basic structure of our event line, and now we're going to be able to start hanging some of those books of the Bible on here so that we be, can begin to, um, as we're teaching, to be able to go to those stories quickly, understand where they are in the timeline of, of events. Any questions now? Because I can't wait to get started with the rest, the rest part of this. You guys ready? Okay. <laughs> Again... What we'll talk about is how your Bible helps you put things together. So I have pulled off almost my my entire, entire center section of my my book, book my bookshelf in my office and pulled off some of my Bibles, some of my commentaries, and they're all in the, in the middle of your desk. And those are for or your table. Those are for you to peruse as we talk about these things because you may not have a Bible in your hand or 
the Bible that you have on your phone doesn't have some things we're going to be talking about. It, it does, but maybe not in the, in the places that we're thinking here when it comes to the books. So I put them there so that you can look through them as we, as we move along. So what I want to tell you right now is the way that uh, publishers um, put Bibles together, they want you to understand what you're reading. And so they're, they're, they try their very best to give you a, as many tools as possible so that as you're reading their Bible, and I say their, I mean their, their published version of it, um, they want you to feel good about it. They want you to feel like they're, um, that you're getting something from it. Those publishers are Christians, most likely, um, and they want you to be enriched and to be strengthened uh, through reading of the scripture as much as any, anybody else in, in church. That's why they, they do these things. So they're putting the Bible together. So what do they do to help us read those things? Read the Bible. So let's look at those. <coughs> We're going to look at um, the study Bibles. We're going to look at concordances, cross-references, footnotes, my favorite, maps and diagrams. I love maps and diagrams. Dictionaries, commentaries, guides, books, and we're going to look at digital online resources. We will. I'm looking at the time. We're going to do it. All right. So let's look at this first one. Um, study Bibles and concordances. So look in your stack, and you might have some of the thicker books. And look on the spines and see if any of them say study Bible of some kind or other. And if it does, kind of pull it out. <laughs> I'm going to steal some of the water. Did I put my name on this? Oh, I'm sorry. It's my name. <laughs> All right, let's talk about study gut or study Bibles for a second. Um, so I've got a breakdown, like if you were to go to Mardell's tonight and go into the Bible section, you're going to find a lot of Bibles, right? And a lot of them are going to have this idea of study Bibles, and you're going to have a lot of things that look like study Bibles, okay? So here's what I want to do. I want to kind of break them down into some understanding. So the first is a real true study Bible. A real true study Bible is a Bible that helps us understand what we're reading. And, and those are, I see I saw one, yeah, you've got one here. One of my favorites is uh, this one. It's published by Crossway. Um, and uh, it's a really good study Bible. And I'll talk about what, they, what this has in it in just a second. But it, all it is is just notes about, it has a, all the cross-references, all of the footnotes, and it has uh, diagrams and charts. It has, thing, it has things in here that is just about the Bible itself. Now, there are things, other Bibles, that look like study Bibles, but they're really not. Let me tell you what they are. There are some that are considered devotional Bibles. They look like they have the same structure, the same like long notations at the bottom of, of the passages. But when you read those, those are more devotional things. <clears throat> so study Bibles, we'll talk about how we understand the Bibles, so have those notes. But devotions, they help us apply the Bible. So this is going to be like uh, um, things about like, it'll say some things will be like, this passage relates to this kind of life and, and this life uh, event. And, and helps you think about what's happening in your life, which is important to do, but it's not really a study Bible. It's a devotional. Then you have Bibles that are what I call cultural Bibles. <clears throat> and these are Bibles that, are, that look like study Bibles, that have all the diagrams, have all the little, little um, notations at the bottom. But really, when you look at that, their purpose is to help people understand cultural issues. I think we got one back there. Um, it's that one right Yes. So this one is what I would consider a cultural Bible. It's one of my favorites. I love it. Um, it is called the uh, founding, not founding, it's called the Ancient Fathers Bible. And what it does, its notations, here, Ancient Faith Study Bible, it takes those early church fathers and the notations at the bottom of this Bible is all about what the early church fathers said about these passages. Not about the Bible itself, 
of what, what the early church fathers said about those passages. Again, I think you can see the difference. This is not a study Bible. It is a cultural Bible because it's referring to how it relates to the culture of that time <clears throat> or helping us understand what they were thinking. But it looks like a study Bible. And here's why I want to make that difference is because if you are planning on uh, uh, purchasing a study Bible for yourself, you might find something that looks like this, which looks like a study Bible. But as you start studying it, you're going, okay, there seems to be a lot of opinion in here. There seems to be a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff that's not really about the Bible itself. So what's going on? So I'm kind of preparing you to say, be on the lookout for these cultural levels. They're still really good as long as you understand what it is, right? Then you have personality Bibles. And these are Bibles that are written by specific people, usually they're pastors or scholars. Um, I have a John MacArthur study Bible. He's right there. <coughs> no, that's a Bible commentary. That's a commentary, yes. But I do have one in here. Uh, Here's one. Here it is. Yeah. Is that it? So <coughs> it's a personality. I call it a personality Bible because it's one person's personality and how they're interpreting Scripture. Again, it's a good way to, to look at the Bible, but is it a study Bible? Um, it's a way to be able to study according to what one person says, not according to just the notes in, in the, what I would call a traditional study Bible. And I'll explain that in a second, too. Then you have what I call interest Bibles. And these are uh, Bibles that uh, help us understand and apply the Bible's principles to a specific reader's interest. Um, that one right there. Yes. This one. Is no, it's not this one. It's another, another blue one. What is it? You've got it. What's your What you looking at right there? Yeah, the study. It's the apologetic study, study Bible. It's one of my favorite Bibles, right? Favorite. <clears throat> um, but it's about. It's because I'm interested in apologetics. But it's an apologetics Bible, not a study Bible. So all of its principles are going to be applied towards the idea of apologetics, not according to the passage itself. It's going to take in the passage and applying it to the interest, taking the passage, applying it to a person's opinion, a person's interpretation, taking this, applying it to a cultural set standard, taking this, applying it to a life standard. This study Bible is taking the scriptures and it's interpreting and it's helping you understand the scriptures itself. Here's why I think that the difference is important. Because as you're studying, um, the most important relationship that you have while you're studying the Bible is you and God. And when you are uh, having some of these, um, can I use the word flavor? Let me try flavor. When you're having these specific type of Bibles, they will flavor the way that you're reading the scripture and it, it'll direct you towards a way of understanding versus letting the Holy Spirit direct the way you understand as you're reading uh, um, the study Bible. Now, it helps to be able, like a, pers like a personality Bible, if you have a, a John MacArthur study Bible, he's got a lot of great insights about, about things. And so it'd be great to have some of the insights in there, but it's a lot better to have what other influence you want more than John MacArthur's influence. You want the Holy Spirit's influence. Not just on my carpets. When I was uh, studying for this lesson, I kind of illustrated it with this curve here. What happens a lot of times is when we collect Bibles that are geared towards here, even though they're, 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 they're good, they will oftentimes skew us to thinking of this question. The Bible's more about me, my interests, my cultural context my lifestyle, my love of who is speaking, my love of personality. A study Bible is something that just sticks to what the scripture is talking about. Um, and so I wanted to kind of break this down a little bit, not to say that these are bad, because they're not, but what they, but we have to understand what they are so that we can read them correctly. This personality Bible is a person's opinion, not inspired, 
love John MacArthur, but he's not inspired. Um, my own personal interest is not inspired. Uh, cultural basis, cultural issues are not inspired. So we want to understand this inspired word of God here, and and I think that we we want to. I would I would say we want to stick to the to the, the foundational principles of the study Bible. We'll talk about that with this one. So, what makes a great study Bible? So when you're looking through at Mardell's and you're saying, what makes a great study Bible? Um, here's what I would put. I'm an artist, and so my first thing I put on here was illustrations. It's got to have great illustrations. It's got to have great pictures. Yes. Yeah, turn out. <coughs> yeah, sorry. It's got to have great pictures. That's what I'm saying. Um, some of these study Bibles have some really great illustrations, uh, really great diagrams, really great maps. But more than that, <coughs> uh, you should be looking for, in those notations, Historical uh, notes, historical explanation, textual explanations. It means it'll, it'll say something like this verse um, talks about that when John talks about uh, is quoting this passage from the Old Testament. Here's what the Old Testament passage says: uh, context summaries, book introductions. Look at the beginning of your Bible, and there should be some kind of introduction at that beginning of that of that book. Uh, the book of John, look at the beginning of John. There should be an introduction in there. That introduction is valuable. Um, it'll tell you what the, uh, what, why did John write it? Who was he writing it to? Uh, what are some of the, the, the uh, problems that, are, that, uh, it, it, that, that, are, that exist in translating John? Uh, basic outlines. You want to be able to have uh, a basic outline of what the books are, so you want to look through that. Some doctrinal explanations. <clears throat> Finding entries that tie the Old Testament to the New Testament. And a lot of times, scholarly articles in the back. So, um, why do we want to use one? We want to learn from scholars and experts. Um, it's a basic understanding, and, and so scholars and experts are writing into this, saying here's what, here's what we've learned about this passage, especially historically. So knowing some of that is great. To gain confidence and understanding. Once you begin to understand the scripture because of the, those notes, you're going, okay, I feel better about what I'm learning. And to be further inspired for further study and research. That's why a study Bible is really important. If you don't have one in your, in your library, uh, they're worth the 60, 70 bucks to be able to get one. Let's talk about the next part is a great concordance. Uh, a concordance is usually found in the back of your Bible. And um, if you look in the back, it's usually that list. looks almost like a, a dictionary type thing. A lot of times it's alphabetical. <clears throat> so if you want to look in some of those back in the backs of some of those Bibles on your desk. <coughs> you see those? So those, uh, the, what those do is you, you, you have a word, uh, most people use it this way. I forgot a verse, I know it has this word in it. So you go to the concordance, you find that word, and you find the verse that's in that word. That's one way that people use it for. Another person, way, way people use it is to go, okay, I want to find out where this word is used in other parts of Scripture. You get a lot of, of uh, interpretation and understanding of a word when you see how it's used in other parts of Scripture. So you use a concordance to <clears throat> know uh, where else the words use for meanings. <clears throat> My voice is just gone. I don't know what's going on. Um, a great concordance will have exhaustive entries. One of my favorite concordances is Rhymes. Who's got it? You guys have got it. So this right here. I'll tell you a story about when I found this on the, on the uh, I think I was in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I was in the Christian bookstore and I saw this and I opened it up and I literally just kind of fell to my knees and my question was, where have you been all my life? <laughs> um, if you look at this, this is a, a concordance that's structured as a systematic theology. And so if you want to know about like uh, the, the personhood of Jesus, then you can look up person of Jesus and it has all the verses in scripture that relate to the person of Jesus. 
What? I mean, the reason, the, the kind of wealth that's inside this is amazing. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a concordance that I refer to often, um, and it kind of shows. This will help us understand all the places in Scripture where, if we want to talk about a certain topic, we can find those verses that are in this one. So I'll let you guys look at this one. You can even pass it around. It's a really great structure. Um, <clears throat> easily attainable, meaning it should be pretty accessible. Usually it's in the back of your Bibles. That's one of the reasons why I'm, I, I'm, I grieve that the digital Bibles are going to take precedence is because there's no concordance at, at, your, at, your, at your fingertips. Um, now, we will get to a way to get to a concordance pretty easy, but um, having that in there. All right. And clearly broken down, so there should be a way to be able to, when you look at an entry, looking at all the other verses that's underneath that entry, should, there should be some explanation about what that verse is saying so that you can easily go, oh, that's not what I'm looking for, or that's what I'm looking for, I'm looking for this verse here. If you look at look in your concordances, you'll see what I'm talking about. The verse will have a word, like peace, and it'll have a summary, a brief, abbreviated summary of the verse with the verse address, and it'll have all those things that relate to peace under there. All right, so I guess, now let's, let's, let's move on one more, one more time, and we'll, we'll uh, look at our, the Bible some more. <clears throat> so, inside of the text block, let's look at this for a second. So a text block is what, what's considered the, 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 sometimes it's a dual column, sometimes it's a single column, but it's a column of, of, of text that's inside your Bible that is considered scripture, right? And there's numbers all over the place, numbers and letters that are little bitty italicized numbers all over the place. Um, some people know what those are, some people don't. I'm guessing that all of you know what those numbers are. But let's talk about them just in case. So <clears throat> in the verses, you'll have at the beginning of each verse, you'll have a large number. What does that refer to? That's the verse, right? Okay, now those, were, those, are, <clears throat> those are not inspired. Those were introduced uh, in 16, I want to say 16, something, somewhere around the translation of, of uh, the authorized version. And St. Stephen is the one who put the numbers in there, so I'll take claim to that. <laughs> uh, and he did it uh, mostly because uh, he was realizing a lot of people were having trouble finding verses, and so he said, well, let's just do what they do for poetry and just write it out the same way. So that's where those big numbers come from. That's got to be that is right, and that's where some of these. DC. Are. So, hey, it's, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Two seconds ago. I'm taking credit where credits. In the All right, but there are some where there's little numbers and little letters. Now, unfortunately, there's no um, there's no standard for these, so different Bibles do it differently. Um, but some of those ref will refer to footnotes. So it's either going to be a letter or a number, and it'll be at the bottom of your, of your page. You see those things in there? Okay. Typically speaking, those will refer to any kind of uh, textual notations. Like, you'll see some things about this, this verse is, is translated this way in a lot of other manuscripts. Or in some of them, they'll say this verse isn't included in many of the earliest manuscripts. So your footnotes are going to include a lot of your translation notes, your structural notes. Then you'll have letters or numbers that will be on the sides of your page, or usually sometimes in the middle of the page. And those are your cross references. You guys know what the cross references are for? Yeah. What are those for? Well, a lot of times, like if, <coughs> if like Jesus is quoted, like if, you know, when Jesus is following you, quoted the Old Testament. Yes. If a verse that he's quoting from is from Exodus, it'll have the verse that he's quoting from, so you can go back and look at what he's. Or, what he's, or whatever it is, it's referencing that. That's a, that's a great example of, of what the what a cross reference will be. What's another reason for a cross reference? Another example of a cross reference that you've seen? Same words. Same words. Yeah. So same words. That what you're saying? Same. same. So, yeah. So similar words, and so or similar ideas, and so they'll they'll say um, it'll refer to either a phrase or a word. Um, and it'll say this this phrase that Paul is using is also reflected in these passages over here. The only part 
of your Bible that's inspired is what? Scripture, which is that which is the internal text. The numbers aren't inspired. Uh, the numbers don't mean anything about you know when a verse, when a passage starts or stops. A lot of times, as was already noted, sometimes those verse breaks are in really inconvenient spots. Totally breaks up what, especially Paul, who wrote in sentences that were almost pages long. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, so those aren't even inspired. So what what does this mean? <clears throat> when you're studying any kind of resource, you have to realize a couple things, both on your of yourself and with other people. It's this: is that you have a lens that you're looking through. You have a way of looking at the world, <clears throat> of discerning what is really true, what's not true. We call that a worldview, and so. We could be looking at the same mountain of evidence, the very same mountain of evidence, but because it's going through our own unique sense of worldview, then it's going to be processed differently. Now, I even go further to say this. When our brains store that information, it gets skewed again because we think differently and we process information differently. I'm a visual person, and so our thoughts and our beliefs will store that information incorrectly. <laughs> and then I'll go even further, is that when we try to recall that information to, to, to communicate it to someone else, it gets skewed another time because it goes to the same process of thoughts and beliefs. <clears throat> How many of you, when you have an idea, when you're sharing it, you're like, I don't know if I want to share it because I might get some pushback on this idea. Well, that's a worldview. Uh, or um, you are afraid of sharing it because you know there's someone in the room that's going to disagree with you. So, uh, so this whole process that's in our own minds is going to skew things. We have to, I think, we have to understand that about ourselves as we're studying the Bible. Um, and by knowing a little bit about this process, I heard a phrase that goes like this: "Be thoughtful on how you think." Think about how you're thinking. When you're studying scripture, think about how you're thinking. Um, and you, you can, you can be caught, you can be aware of how you're thinking and processing information. Uh, Charles, no, not Charles McDonald. Who's the other guy? Um, Stanley. Stan, St Stanley? Uh, he's, the, he's the marriage guy back in the, in the 80s. Charles Stanley. I forget, doesn't matter. What's that? Dobson, that's who it was. Thank you, James, <laughs> James Dobson. Thank you. Not even close. So James Dobson, I was in a, in a, a seminar with him, and I got to be on the front row. And there was a couple times he's like talking right to me, which is really cool. Um, but he said that there were studies that were being done that um, it takes thirty seconds for a thought to be hardwired into a in, into your mind. Thirty seconds, and so if you're aware of how you're thinking about that thought you can speak truth into that thought as it's being filed away into your brain versus just letting it go on its own willy nilly, right? <laughs> so um, you can be thoughtful about this whole process. And I think as we're studying, it's important that we are aware of ourselves, <clears throat> our, own, our own condition, our own thought processes. Um, this is a, uh, Aaron Glover and I were talking about this, and I thought I would put it in, into a parable. This is resources and ice cream. <coughs> Two people can argue over which is best, strawberry ice cream or chocolate ice cream. And all they're doing is arguing over which ice cream flavor is best. <laughs> this was this is an example. Okay. We're not <laughs> I had a friend who said that uh, vanilla wasn't the flavor, so. Oh, right. <laughs> See, this, this is applying right here. So which flavor is better, which flavor is better? If you're too busy arguing about which flavor is better, guess what you're not doing? Eating the ice cream. Eating the ice cream. <clears throat> so uh, two people arguing over ice cream flavors and at Baskin Robbins loving, uh, Robbins loving ice cream. And I got two people loving their ice cream. So we can come to our resources, come to our commentaries, come to our maps, come to our books that we're gonna be looking at, <clears throat> and we can say, you know what? There's gonna be a flavor in these things. And we can, uh, we can 
we can come to a place where we say, I, I like this flavor, I like this flavor, but you know what? We're gonna understand that we love scripture. And you may like it this way, and I may like it this way, mm-hmm. but we're gonna come together and love scripture together instead of arguing about which is better and which is not as good. Strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this verse has come up so many times in the past week Um, we dealt with this with the Seder service we did Paul says it this way he says uh, for now we see in a mirror dimly but then we'll see face to face now I know in part then I shall know fully so what he's saying here is, is on this side of life on this side of our reality we see things darkly. We don't know the truth. We don't know. We don't know. We just know in part. We know there's something else out there. There's something else that we're missing that we're not seeing clearly. But Paul says, I, I know these things. I know I don't see things clearly. I know I don't know things fully. But what I do know of this is one thing <laughs> that I have been fully known. So he's saying that no matter what we understand, no matter where we go, we don't we know one thing. God is good. God is, God is loving, and God is with us in all ways, in all things, in all t- times, trials, rejoicings. He is with us. And Paul says, so it really doesn't matter what I don't know. It doesn't really matter what I just see dimly, because what I do know is what matters the most, that God is good, and he knows me fully. <clears throat> so as we're looking at Scripture, <clears throat> my wife, when she teaches, um, she'll say, if you come to a place in scripture where you don't understand what's going on or what's you don't understand what's being said there's a moment where things seem troubling go to the, go to your foundational understanding god is good god is loving and his glory will be revealed and by just going to those three foundational truths as you begin to process that difficult situation like some of the things in the old testament god is good god's glory will be revealed those things will know because i've been really known. does that make sense so we're understanding scripture in that way. <clears throat> so now we're looking at things that are outside of your Bible uh, that you buy in a bookstore, your dictionaries and your commentaries. We talked a little bit about that, so we'll go um, real close. <coughs> a dictionary is a reference book of articles on people, place, things, and concepts of the Bible, especially how they address are addressed about scripture. A good dictionary is just the facts on on a, an entry very few of your of your dictionaries will give opinion about some things they may say things like early church fathers thought this or they may say uh, there was understanding about this pr- principle or doctrine but it really it's just going to be an entry <clears throat> and a description about that of that one entry a commentary is different a commentary <clears throat> is a reference book but it's usually written by a scholar or pastor which contains information about a background, concepts, doctrines, and teachings throughout uh, scripture, surrounding scripture verses. But the focus I'm going to put on here is back to this, written by a scholar or a pastor. Typically your commentaries are going to be written by one of those two. <clears throat> Some of my favorite commentaries, Wayne Grudem. I love Wayne Grudem. Um, but he's very, very conservative and very hard line. Then I also like uh, Warren Wearsby. Warren Wearsby is cuddly. Um, he writes very nice things. He writes very soft. Uh, uh, Grudem is raw. This, he's like tough love, right? Yeah. But, uh, wait, uh, but uh, Warren Wearsby is kind of nice. But I put those two together, and guess what I get? I get I get a I get the a true hard cuddle. Hard cuddle. Hard cuddle. Right? Hard cuddle. <laughs> <laughs> is that a head? Uh, we don't really get this in our western thought um, eastern thought understands this I think better but we want to say something is true and untrue especially when it's paradoxical when really um, especially the way in Hebrew writing there, the tension is where the truth is found not in this side or this side it's actually that in the middle part not a, not a um, um, what's the word I'm looking for um, it's a C word. I can't remember the word. When you when you have two truths or two things, you want to compromise. <clears throat> Not a compromise, but that tension between the two 
that's where we want to find that truth is in that tension. So I'll go to I'll go to Wearsby and I'll go to uh, Groom and I'll look at that and I'll say, okay, this is what they're both are saying. I, I can find the truth about these two people's opinions in, in how they differ sometimes. <laughs> Does that make sense? Have you guys encountered, uh, uh, encountered this before when you're going through scriptures, going through your commentaries? <clears throat> Guides and books. <coughs> I'm going to blaze through this. <clears throat> you go to books. Oh, man, my voice. It's going as we speak. Um, when you go to the bookstore and you find a. Um, there's a place called study guides. Uh, you'll find different types of study guides, and I think it's important we talk about that real quick. Some study guides are going to be very topical. Um, you'll find that it's usually the, in the title. It's very topical. But on the flip side, <clears throat> some of them are very sequential, meaning one point builds on the next. <clears throat> some of your uh, your guides are designed for closed groups, meaning a small group of people. And after you form your group of people, no one else is invited, right? <clears throat> Others are more of an open uh, inclusion. Some are designed for small groups, <clears throat> and some of them are designed for large groups. <clears throat> some of them are designed for uh, dated material, <clears throat> and some of them are what I call eternal. <laughs> it means they go on and on and on. There's no real dead, there's no real end time for those things, right? <clears throat> now this is where I geeked out about this so if you want to look at it further we can we can talk about it but just let me geek out for a second when I saw this I was like wait a minute let's put, let's put this all together so I did that oh. now hold on I may have thought way too much about this I get this right but if you took a, if you had a, a guy a study guy that was topical was for closed groups, for small groups, and had no no discerning end time. Guess what you've got? You've got a curriculum for a life group. Those groups that meet for to meet at someone's house, and there really is no deadline. There's no there's no course or anything. This is just designed for on topic. If it is a small group, there's no end time. It's sequential. And it's for open groups. All and everybody's invited. And guess what you have? You have a Sunday school class. If it's closed, topical, dated for large groups, you have something for a seminar. Those weekend seminars that you, we have sometimes. Um, dated, <coughs> large group, open, sequential. You have got yourself a conference or a sermon. Are we a conference? What's that? Are we a conference? Yeah. <laughs> <Good. laughs> conference. Maybe. It's not topical. It is. So, so no. I thought way too much about this. Yeah, I totally understand. Right? It looks nice. Mm -hmm. In the middle, you say? Right. It looks nice. It looks nice, right? right. It it looks say, <coughs> but it's usually what I find here. So, these are the web tools that I find <coughs> are most often trustworthy. I use uh, Bible Hub all the time. It is so great. Uh, Bible Gateway is another one I use all the time. <coughs> Blue Letter Bible, I just discovered a few weeks ago. Um, I say just discovered, I knew it was there, but I just started using it. There are some really cool things here. The Net Bible, I haven't used it, but I heard a lot of people who do use it. Um, you're gonna find in those platforms, um, very little uh, opinion, very little in terms of, 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 of other thought, except for just what's in the scripture. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. And these are free. Bible Hub, Bible Gateway are probably my favorites. Free web teaching resources. Two of them that I really find that I've never really been disappointed with is uh, the Bible Project. Um, they make videos. Um, they're on YouTube. They're free. Um, great content. The only thing I would say, if I would say anything, would be they're a little heavy on social justice. That's my only complaint that I would have with, with them. <coughs> but they're from Portland, so you expect that. <laughs> um, so Bible Project Got Questions um, Got Questions is a great great resource it's a website that you you can you type in a question it'll come up with an article and 
you can, there's a way to submit your question personally to some of the researchers there. And we've done that many, many times and we get an answer back. And even my wife, when she was doing the apologetics course last quarter, um, they were having a dialogue back and forth. And, uh, and so it was really neat to watch that process. So gotquestions.org and uh, bibleproject.com. Great resources, uh, Bible Projects on YouTube. Uh, I, I was gonna show a video, but we can't. So just go to Bible Project on YouTube or, or the website. Great stuff there. Watch the video on holiness. <clears throat> it's really, really good. <clears throat> these are uh, digital study tools. These, are, these, uh, these cost money and a lot of money. Um, Logos Bible software. Um, I don't use these anymore because I don't have the money. I mean, this, is, this is almost like $1,200 right here. Um, Olive Tree is a good one. I haven't used Accordance before, uh, but I saw that one. Um, but uh, these are really intense uh, and really diverse ways to, to study scripture, but they do cost money with that. Um, and then some Bible apps. Uh, Uversion is a good one. And the Bible recap. U version is um, like if you were to highlight a scripture as you're studying it, uh, that highlight goes on to the full platform of U version, and it'll it'll say, "Here's how many other people highlighted this verse to you." And so you're like studying with the nation or studying with the world, uh, basically when you're looking through that. And the Bible recap, and that's the end of my slides right there. Um, if we have time, can I show you one of the platforms? You guys want to go through that real quick? I'll just take maybe another five minutes. You guys want to do that? Yeah, sure. <coughs> right. I do apologize for my voice. I really, really do. Hey, tomorrow's Steve's birthday. Tomorrow's my birthday. You guys didn't know. Oh. Happy birthday, Steve. Happy birthday, Steve. Happy birthday, Steve. Happy birthday, Steve. Um, somebody pick a verse. Somebody pick a verse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll pick a verse. Here. A verse? Yeah. <laughs> um, Exodus 12 10. Exodus 12 10. What is that? There's so much. All right, so this is Bible Hub. Um, right now, I have it set on um, Hebrew Strong's, and look what it does. It breaks it down. Here's the English here, and the Hebrew over here, and then the Strong's number that goes with that Hebrew word, and then it even has the, the uh, declension for that Hebrew word. So if you understand the, like the, uh, what a conjugative, uh, I don't know what those are. Uh, I didn't study Hebrew, so um, so you can you can click on these things and really understand what uh, the original language is talking about uh, and how it's translated here. Um, you can come to let's do ESV. So there's Exodus and ESV right there with all the notes, with all the the, the diagrams in color. Right there. Um, keep on going to the end. Here's your footnotes. Um, you want to do a parallel? Here's a parallel of, the, of that. Um, here's a study of the English study Bible. Um, and then the Hebrew. You do a chapter. So here's NIV, ESV, NASV, KJV, uh, Column Christianity. Do you see this? This is real powerful. So you can look through all these. And it's all based on this one verse here. Um, if you want to see the sermons on that verse, click on there. Um, interlinear. So interlinear is the same thing, but it's, but it's on top of each other. So here's the English translation. Here's the Hebrew. Here's the transliteration of the Hebrew. Here's the Strong's numbers. And here's the declension right there. Um, so you can see this can get really, really super powerful. Um, the outline. Come on, come on. There it is. So here's the outline of that of that passage. Egypt, Israel, and Egypt. So all those things that are in the study Bible is now online. You get the outlines. You can get those uh, those Greek words and all that. Good stuff.
good stuff. The other platforms are just as good. They just have it formulated in a different way. And so we can do that. Thank <music> you.